the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-nabi, ya ayyuha al-lazina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the believers, the angels, send salawat, they send salam on the Prophet, peace be upon him. And then there's a command, O believers, send salam on the Prophet. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala nabiyyina wa habibina Muhammad. When this verse was revealed, the companions, the muhajirun and the ansar, their response to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in al-tabari was that it's not fair that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gets a verse, gets salawat, gets salam from Allah and the angels. What about them? And so then Allah revealed another verse. And that other verse is huwa alladhi yusalli alaykum wa malaikatuhu li yukhrijakum min al-dhulumati ila nur wa kana bil mu'minin rahima that he is the one who sends salawat upon you and the angels send send those same salawat to guide you out of the darknesses to the light and he is so merciful to the believers what does it look like when angels send salawat on you why is it important that the angels send salam on you? When the angels send salawat upon you, different scholars of tafsir mention that one, when Allah says, Huwa ladhi yusalli alaykum, it means that He sends His mercy upon you. It means that He sends blessings upon you. It means that He gives His protection to you. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends angels, commands angels to do the same. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands angels that they are to the right and to the left and to the front and behind you. That angels are there just to protect you. Can angels do anything except what they're commanded to do? No. This means that the angels themselves are ordered to do nothing except for protect you and pray for you. The angels we know are on our right and on our left. And my Sheikh, Sheikh uh, Abdul Ladib, he was telling me that, mashallah, he's a person of the Qur'an, he's a scholar of the Qur'an, he has the shortest sanad in the world. And he said that when he makes a mistake, and of course this is like, okay, his mistakes are not like our mistakes. This is, <laughs> his mistake is like, I didn't realize that I cut someone off in traffic. And then I start saying, Astaghfirullah. And then I turn to the angel and I say, don't write it down. I'm going to make Astaghfar. He's not making dua to the angel. He's not asking the angel to, for forgiveness. He's just interacting with the angels that are around us and that are part of our lives. The angel on the right, when we do something right, we know that the angel writes it down, and sometimes it's just one good deed, sometimes it's 10, sometimes it's 700, sometimes it's more than that. And we know that the angel on the left is ordered to wait, so that if you do something wrong, there is a command from Allah, that the angels are commanded, because the angels can't do anything except for what Allah commands. They're wait, they have to wait until it is some time, because you might ask for forgiveness. And if you ask for forgiveness, then the angels don't write it down as a bad deed. And in fact, if you intend to do good and you don't do it, it's written as good. If you intend to do bad and you don't do it, it's still written as good. But the angel on the left waits. And then they ask, okay, now should I write it down? And then they're told, no, wait, they still might repent. And this conversation keeps happening until finally, finally, then it's written as one bad deed. The angels interact with us in the way not only that they watch over us and that they write for us what we do, but also in the specific way they pray for us. Imam al baghawi mentioned that if one angel were to ask for the forgiveness of all the believers, it would be enough for all of the believers to have just one angel. But Allah, in more than one occasion in the Qur'an, talks about a legion of angels asking for the believer's forgiveness. An entire legion of angels. There's a verse in the Qur'an that, subhanAllah, just blows my mind in terms of how much he raises our ranks when he commands angels to do something for us. 
Allah talks about the angels who hold up the arsh. They are the ones, الَّذِينَ يَحْمِلُونَ الْعَرْشِ They hold up the throne of Allah. And what do they do? They believe in Him. يُؤْمِنُونَ بِهِ وَيَسْتَغْفِرُونَ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا What is يُؤْمِنُونَ بِهِ? The angels are holding up the throne of Allah. Okay? Angels, beings of light, created by Allah. Do they believe in Allah? Obviously, they're holding up the arsh of Allah. Do they believe in Him? No doubt. Why would Allah say they believe in Him? When obviously the angels believe in Him. Shaykh al-Sha'arawi mentions because there's this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that they believe only in what He has allowed them to know. They don't have the ilmul ghayb. They don't know the unseen. They don't know what's going to happen in the future. The only one who has that knowledge is Allah. And so they hold up the arsh. They believe in what they have been taught by Him and ordered to know by Him. And that's it. And then what? This is so incredible because Allah ties the repentance, the asking for forgiveness of all of us to who? To Allah Himself. The angels are holding up the throne of Allah. They believe in Him. And what do they do? Literally nothing. But praise Him and make dua for us. That they ask for our forgiveness. And in the next verse, they ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala joins us with our loved ones in the hereafter. That not only, of course, would we want to be with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and the, and the righteous people in the hereafter. But when you think about the hereafter, don't you also want to see your, your child? Don't you also want to see your mom? Don't you also want to see your sibling, your friends, your cousins? And sometimes for some of us, we don't know what that's going to look like, even for ourselves, but also for loved ones that we have who either don't believe in Islam or maybe they have at some point and they don't care anymore. Many of us know what that's like. Many of us know what that fear and that pain is like. And sometimes when we feel all alone in that moment of sadness for the people that we love, and of course we don't know where we are going to be. We pray that Allah enters us into the highest paradise, but only Allah knows, of course. But we hope for his mercy more than our deeds. One time a man walked into the masjid of the Prophet wasallam, and he was just overwhelmed with sadness. And the Prophet wasallam asked him, and he was like, my sins, my sins. So the Prophet wasallam taught him to say a dua, Allahumma, your forgiveness is greater than my sins. And my hope in you is greater than my deeds, than my hope in my deeds. That we sometimes don't have hope in Allah's mercy because we don't feel like we deserve it. I had a sister tell me, this was on TikTok, she wrote a comment, a public comment. She said, how do I know, how do I know that I have hope with Allah when he's mad at me? And I asked her, how do you know Allah is mad at you? How could you know? How could you possibly know that Allah is mad at you? And she said that she got really angry with her husband. And every time she sleeps, she dreams that she's going to sleep without saying the shahada at the end of life. And I thought, subhanAllah, who has taught her about Allah? Who has taught her about Allah that her, 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 her relationship pain manifests in her having dreams that she's not going to be able to say the shahada at death. That's not wahi from Allah saying that he's mad at you or that you're not going to believe in Islam. That's having serious, very real, very understandable issues in life, needing to work with a therapist and a mental health professional to navigate those emotions. And inshallah, those dreams will change when your emotions also change. And inshallah, you'll always be given the glad tidings of paradise. But that idea that so many of us hold on to so often is especially in Ramadan. It's been a few days. I am nowhere near where my goals of Ramadan actually were before I started. Please nod your head if you've maybe recognized that you are also not exactly where you want to be. <laughs> That's like so many heads. And at this point, I'm looking at myself and I'm thinking, my goals were very high. 
and it's only been a few days. And there is literally no way I can catch up right now. I will not be able to meet my, I already, from now, I can't meet my goals. But, no, literally, they're really high. There's no way five days are done. But then I think, okay, did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala know that I wanted to? He knows what you want to do. And is he going to reward you for that intention itself? Yes. So when we're looking in Ramadan and we're thinking that how is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even going to forgive me when I am not even holding up to what I've chosen as goals for myself, redirect that concept. It's not about what I am doing. It's about the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful anyway. Don't rely on the fact that you are generous for his generosity. He is generous whether or not you're generous. Yes, of course, when we are generous, he is more generous. Of course, when we worship him to the best of our ability, it's even more blessings. But does that mean that if you're struggling and you're trying and you want to, but you haven't been able to, that he won't accept you? Who taught us that? And why is it sometimes that that voice in our head, that we are not good enough for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not just a voice in our head, but rather the way that we cast upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and assume that that's how he sees us. Allah is not your internal thoughts. Well, billah. Your self-loathing is not Allah seeing you in a self-loathing way. That's how I feel about myself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one His mercy encompasses everything. One of the companions used to say, Oh Allah, when he would recite this verse, he would say, I'm something. I'm something. So, oh Allah, cover your mercy upon me. And that mercy, that exact concept of mercy, is the one that the angels make dua for for us. Who are lilladina amanu? Allah could have said, Lil mu'mineen. Lil mu'mineen is someone who embodies the action of belief, they embody it. You look at them, that is mu'mineen. That is someone who is acting on it, living it every single moment. Muhsinin lil muhsinin, muhsinin. The people who do even better, they strive even farther and even more. But lil ladina amanu, amanu is a verb, past tense. They have believed. What does that mean? It means that in their heart there is belief, and yet their actions struggle to match that belief. So when you feel like you're not doing enough, remind yourself that in a Ramadan night on a Sunday, you were at the masjid. That is a lot. That is an invitation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lilladina amanu are the people who believed and their actions struggle to keep up with the belief. What about the believers who are fasting in Ramadan? What about the believers who come to the masjid when they don't have to? What about the believers who hate themselves when they make a mistake and they want to do better and they still mess up, but they want to do better? That is even more. You're, 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 you're more deserving of the dua of the angels. You're even more deserving of the dua of the angels who are commanded to make dua just for the people who believe and they struggle. What about the people who believe and they struggle? Yes, but they're trying. So the angels, when they make dua for us, it's not something that we hear passively, oh, there are angels. That's really exciting. We'll believe in them. They are physically present, protecting us. They are making dua for us even when we feel alone. And a story in the Quran that encapsulates this so powerfully is that of Maryam alayhi salam's mother and that of Zakaria alayhi salam and that of Maryam alayhi salam. When the mother of Maryam alayhi salam learns that she's pregnant, she is ecstatic. And we know this from different tafsir that she had struggled with being pregnant. She couldn't get pregnant. She was struggling with infertility. And when she saw a little bird feeding her babies, she started making dua. And she made dua that Allah would bless her with her own child. And then she got pregnant. And now you can imagine her joy and her excitement. And then she loses her husband, Imran, alayhi salam. 
So she goes from being so excited, so excited, because she's going to be a mother finally, to the loss of her husband, now as a widow, and how is she going to navigate having a baby? And this is when she makes a particular dua. Inni nadartu laka ma fi batni muharraram fataqabbal minni innaka anta samiul alim. The way that she makes dua here is very vulnerable. That she is broken. Innaka anta samiul alim. He is the one who hears. He is the one who knows. He's he is the only one who is actually there. This dua parallels the dua of Zakaria alayhi salam, which just a few, ver- well, this is a different surahs. This is mainly in Surah Ali Imran and Surah Maryam. So Zakaria alayhi salam is described in different ways. That one, he enters upon Maryam and he sees that she has this fruit out of season that inspires him to go to dua. So then immediately, هُنَالِكَ دَعَى زَكَرِيَّا رَبَّهُ Immediately he goes and he makes dua. Now, how is this dua made? The description of it in Surah Maryam is one where, I have to tell you, subhanAllah, I have heard du'as be made, as all of us have heard du'a be made, right? Sometimes they rhyme, sometimes they're kind of flowy, sometimes it's almost like someone is singing or very poetic. But when I was studying in Egypt, the imam, the way he would make du'a is the first time I heard du'a on a, on a wide level, on a wide scale, because he was making dua in tarawih and he would make dua in the witr. And the way he would make dua, it was just, oh Allah, if you do not forgive us, who is going to forgive us? Begging Allah, la taruddana khaibin, do not turn us away, do not turn us away. Oh Allah, if you do not open your doors for us, who is going to open their doors for us? Ya Allah, don't turn us away, don't turn us away. The way he would cry, and it wasn't this crying like, it wasn't like, yes, we all, we all have emotion, right? But it was the intensity of someone who knows they have nowhere else to go. This brokenness, this complete humility, this, oh Allah, I have shattered pieces of my heart in my hands and I'm taking them to you and glue them back together. That emotion we feel in the Quran. When Zakaria alayhi salam is making dua, and he is saying so humbly, my, my, my bones have become frail, that his hair has, bec- has turned color because he's become so old. Here's an elderly man here, that his wife has been barren, that he's calling out because he wants to have a child to be able to uh, continue the message of Islam, to continue the message of prophethood. As he is calling out like this, this intensity of whisper, the intensity of call, where no one else is around you, but you are desperate. Zakaria alayhi salam is making this dua, and he's a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's a prophet of Allah, and he cares for Maryam alayhi salam, the first woman to enter Baytul Maqdis. And yet, we can imagine that he's been making dua his whole life. We can imagine, because he's a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now, this is the moment in his elderly age that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to answer this dua. And when he does, the next verse, فَنَادَتْهُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ That the angels called to him and gave him the glad tidings. Immediately, the dua was answered within a second that the angels were there. Now, there's a different in, difference of opinion on if they are the angels, a group of angels that gave him this glad news, or if it was Angel Jibreel alayhi salam. Because Angel Jibreel has the highest ranking of the angels, and so to, to refer to him in this plural is intended to honor him. So whether it was Angel Jibreel alayhi salam or a group of angels, the point is that Zakaria alayhi salam was inspired to make dua after seeing Maryam alayhi salam and her certainty that Allah gave her this fruit out of season because Allah can provide whatever he wants for whomever he wills. This certainty and the way she says this ayah, subhanAllah, inna Allah yarzuqu man yasha'u bi ghayri hisab. Even whether you write it, you, whether you recite it with Inna Allah yarzuqu man yasha'u bi ghayri hisab or hisab, whatever the maqam you choose to recite it in, you feel the lightness of the verse, that it's powerful because he can choose to do this, but it's also very light. Yeah, Allah can provide whatever he wills. So then what happens right after Zakaria alayhi salam is given the news? What is the next part of the story? Who is given the news? Maryam alayhi salam. So angel Jibreel gives the news to Zakaria. 
Then Angel Jibreel alayhi salam gives the news to Maryam alayhi salam. And when he's giving her this news, first of all, he is in the form of a beautifully formed man is what the Tafsir mentioned. And that when she sees him, her first response is to call him back to Allah. Her first response is to warn him, fear Allah, feel, not Allah, don't, it doesn't say Allah, fear Ar-Rahman, reminding him that the door of mercy is open. Don't do it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful, he can still forgive you before you do anything. Ibn Kathir mentions that he was so scared, he flipped straight into the shape of an angel. And Angel Jibreel alayhi salam's form, he has 600 wings. He has jewels and rubies. This is a, in a, a narration in, in Imam Ahmed, in Muslim Imam Ahmed, that he has jewels and rubies just falling from his wings. That they take the form of people so they don't scare people. But Maryam alayhi salam's words were so powerful that he's the one who flipped back. And then he gave her the glad tidings of a son. And this is so powerful in Arabic because the ahabalaki, to give you the glad tidings, is joyful. Zakariah was given glad tidings and he was joyful of that news, even though he himself was in shock. The, Qur the way the Quran is stated, how is this possible? When my wife is barren, how is this possible? And they're in their elder age. However, Allah SWT wants, he can do it. Okay, juxtapose the joy with the glad tidings that Maryam alayhi salam re received. Her reaction is not to say, I'm chosen. It's not to say, Alhamdulillah. And maybe, honestly, maybe it was to say those things, but that's not what Allah recorded. He recorded her shock. What are people going to say? Thinking about how this is going to impact the way that people are going to see piety because she's the paragon of piety. Her reaction wasn't to receive the gift from Allah with immediate joy. And, it, and if it was, that's not what Allah chose to reveal to us, which in and of itself tells us something, that when something doesn't seem like a gift to us, or sometimes it seems like it's supposed to be a gift, but it doesn't feel like one, that there's space to navigate that. And this is where the role of the angels is so important for us, because there are going to be times that we feel completely alone, and no one in our family is going to understand, even if they care about us. And no one is really fully going to grasp the intensity of the emotion that we're going through or the fact that we have to numb ourselves so that we don't feel that emotion. And especially when someone says something like, why would you get upset over that? Or why are you crying? Or hasn't it been long enough? Think about the prophet. What does it mean, hasn't it been long enough that you've been sad? Hasn't it been long enough that you've been upset? Hasn't it been long enough that you've missed someone? Hasn't it been long enough that you've been crying? Yaqub didn't cry for a day or two days. He cried for decades. In one uh, tafsir for 40 years before he was reunited with Yusuf. Can you imagine a Prophet of Allah being told, be patient, being told, and he was told in the Quran, he was told, how much longer are you going to remember Yusuf? And what does he say? I complain only to Allah. I complain only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I know from him what you don't know. Of course, for us, we complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we need to seek support, whether that's therapy or other forms of support, it's critical. But the point is that Yusuf alayhi salam, for all those years, was not reunited with his father. And it was so long before Yaqub alayhi salam stopped crying. Think about Ibrahim alayhi salam. And it wasn't just the town that kicked him out of, the, of, the, of, of their village. It was his father that threw him into a fire. What does that look like when your own father is the one throwing you into a fire? And that's real. Even today, that's real. Many individuals struggle with that in their families. Think about in the Quran, Nuh alayhi salam. The verses of Nuh calling his son to believe in him are so hard to read. It's just so emotional. Just... Just come. Just come into the ship. Just come. Sa'awi ila Jabal. I'm just gonna Jabal. I'm just gonna go to the mountain. Just gonna go. The mountain's gonna save me. Many of you know this pain because you have a loved one and you weep for them and you care for them. But subhanAllah, Nuh alayhi salam. 
He's a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he went through this gut-wrenching pain. Every single one of the prophets and every single one of the righteous, Asya alayhi salam, Maryam alayhi salam, when we look at their stories, they had intense loneliness. Being alone, feeling like there is no one else who can understand you is part of their narrative. And in none of those stories would we ever say, hasn't it been long enough? Astaghfirullah, we would never say that to a prophet. So why do we say that to our own selves? Forget saying it to other people. Why do we say it to ourselves? Why do we expect that we need to be in a particular place at a particular time with our iman? When the fact that we cry is a sign, or the fact that we don't cry but we feel it is a sign that we're trying to navigate real life but still with belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know that subhanAllah, Badr, the, uh, the battle of Badr, the battle of Badr was in Ramadan. And this is the battle in which Allah brought angels upon angels upon angels to fight for the believers, to fight with the believers, to give victory to the believers. The angels were present. They were there helping aid the believers to an impossible victory. And when they did this, and the Prophet ﷺ has the great news that they are the victors, what does he go back to Medina to? He doesn't go back to Medina with this earth-shattering joy. He goes back to Medina to find that Ruqayya, his daughter, has passed away. The fact that in Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't make this month a month of just Qur'an and just Salah and how much did you read and how much are you worshipping? What is worship? Worship is إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ The actions are by your intention. And that looks like taking care of your emotional state and it looks like supporting people in your family and it looks like dealing with the frustration after frustration after frustration of you seeing that no matter what you do, the door is not opening and you're wondering what is the point and where am I going, but you still keep believing in Allah. And that's exactly what we see from the prophets and who aided the prophets but the angels. And Allah promised us that if we believe in him, that he commands the angels to support us. And what are different ways that we can actually bring the angels into our lives? Because as we can hear, the angels are not just these beings of light that just exist and are not interacting with us. We just believe in them and that's it. No, they're actively intervening into our lives. If you've ever got into a car accident, have you, have you ever got into a car accident? Sorry, about to. And then it feels like something literally pushed your car away. Like it actually feels like something just like protected your car from hitting something. SubhanAllah, perhaps that was literally an angel buffering between your car. When you go to salah, when you go to pray, it may feel like something you need to finish quickly. We covered this in the salah class yesterday for those who are at the WVMA. Many times for salah, many of us, it's something we need to do, and we do it. And that's amazing, first of all. May Allah bless every single one of us for trying to pray. But an angel comes to your right. An angel comes to your left. An angel as big as mountains stand behind you. This is Sa'id ibn Musayyib who gives us this narration. Angels as big as mountains stand behind you when you're going to pray. So when you're going to salah, and sometimes it's in the middle of trying to take care of kids running around, sometimes it's in the middle of children climbing your back, sometimes it's in the middle of between meetings or just running for whatever else you have to do. And sometimes, honestly, you don't have other things to do. But maybe it's not something that you're like, oh, I need to pray. I'm so excited. It's like, oh, I still need to pray. But think about the fact that when we go to pray, who is standing as an army with us? One time, subhanAllah, I was with a, a group of Muslims. We were planning an event. And one of the sisters in our group, Sabrine was there when this happened. One of the sisters in our group, she got a phone call. And uh, she just stepped away to take the call. And then she came back, and all she could say was, I need to pray, I need to pray, I need to pray, I need to pray, I need to pray. And we were like, okay. It, w it wasn't time, to, it wasn't a salah time. She just kept saying, I need to pray, I need to pray. We were in, we were, we were at San Jose State. We were in an engineering building. I mean, just, we're just in a building. She just immediately went straight to a corner, and she just started praying, and she started praying, and she started praying. She didn't tell us anything. She just went straight to salah. 
And then she came to us after all of her prayers. And then she had told us that her brother had been hit by a car. And subhanAllah, rahmatullah alayhi, he didn't make it, rahmatullah alayhi, may Allah enter him into the highest paradise, be like he said. That was the first time that I think many of us had witnessed someone take salah immediate, immediately as a, as a rope to hold on to. She didn't tell us. She didn't sit down and say, I don't know what I'm going to do. She didn't say, I, I, I don't know. She just, she just said, I need to pray. And she just went straight to Salah. That moment, that choice to go straight to Salah when you get news like this, this is not just somebody who is praying and trying to finish it. It's someone who is praying and they're aware that the angels are with them. That they're aware that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with them. That when they enter this sacred moment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's a conversation that they are having back and forth with the Lord of all the worlds very personally. It's a very personal connection. And that connection is one that the angels witness and they roam the earth looking for the believers who are not, yes, not just praying, but also doing actions like reciting the Quran. There are angels whose sole job is to roam the earth looking for those who are reciting the Qur'an. And then they go to them. They go to that halaqa. They go to that circle of people who are reciting the Qur'an. And I'm sure that you've heard, many of us, that they surround those people. That with them comes this mercy. That with them comes this tranquility. This feeling of tranquility. Have you ever been with a Qur'an class and you just feel good there? Or you leave it and you feel like refreshed. It's kind of, of course, the barakah of the Qur'an, but also the physical presence of the angels. And the companions, the way that they used to recite the Qur'an, it wasn't simply, of course, it was to recite it quickly, that there's a place, you know, there's a time and a place for all forms of Qur'anic recitation. But when they would recite the Qur'an, they would really recite one verse over and over and over again. They would recite it over and over and try to understand how this verse applies to this moment in their life. And this is a, uh, um, a following of the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, who would stand all night and just recite one ayah into عَذِّبُهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ عِبَادُكُ That if you punish them, then they are your slaves. وَإِن تَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ فَإِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ And if you forgive them, then you are the strongest and the most wise. And this was Isa alayhi salam that Prophet Jesus was responding to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day when he is asked about the people who worship Jesus instead of Allah. But in that conversation is this ayah. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would recite it over and over and over again. Because who is responsible for this entire ummah? But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when we are talking about the angels interacting with us, when you're sitting in your own room and you are reciting the Qur'an and no one else is in your house, who is witnessing it? The angels are witnessing it. And they're, just not, they're not just witnessing it. It's not just the one on your right and your left. There are the angels who are roaming the earth looking for your voice. They're waiting to hear your voice recite the Qur'an. And if you struggle with reciting the Qur'an, then double the reward to you. And if you recite it so beautifully, then you recite it like who? Like the angels. This hadith that those who recite it so beautifully are reciting it like the angels. So when you recite the Quran, know that there are beings of light looking for you, for your voice to recite. Halaqas of dhikr of just remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right now. We're not reciting Quran together, we're mentioning Quran, but remembering Allah. Are there angels present right now? Yes, inshallah. It's a promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what do they do right now? The angels surrounding us. They take the names of all of us. And they go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they have a conversation with Allah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks them, what are my servants asking for? What are they asking for? That we want to go to Jannah. That we don't want to go to hellfire. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a longer narration, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only promises us that, but also promises it to those sisters in the back who are just walking through. And they're not actually sitting, but inshallah, they're getting the reward of it. All of you. Yes, exactly. Exactly. That's so awkward. I didn't mean to make it awkward for you. I'm so sorry. You were just the perfect example. May Allah bless you all. 
Anytime. I got to tell you a secret. I've never told anyone this before. Maybe I shouldn't tell it. Okay, well, maybe you could do it till I get the reward of it. If I ever see a halakha and I'm not part of it, it's like I'm just walking through the masjid, I just stand there for a second. I'm like, oh, Allah, count me as that one person who had no intention of going to the halakha, but they still want to be forgiven. Be that person who just walks through all those beloved brothers. And inshallah, all of that edger is going to them. I'm very serious. I'm not trying. I shouldn't have done that again. I'm sorry. <laughs> but the point is, look at Allah's mercy. He's so merciful that literally someone, whether they're passing through or they're not planning to come or they just came, they just came because someone else was like, hey, let's just go for a little bit. And they were like, I have no interest in doing this, but I, I care about you enough that I'll go. That this person is the one who is counted as the one who is forgiven. This person is the one who, inshallah, is counted as the one who goes to paradise. This person is, inshallah, counted as the one who's saved from hellfire. How merciful is Allah that he wants you to win, that he wants you to win. Allah wants us to win. And this is why, even in our interactions with one another, angels make dua for the one who teaches good. The one who teaches good, angels make dua for them. Okay, when you're thinking teaches good, what is the person that came to mind? Maybe like a Quran teacher? Maybe like someone who teaches Islam? But what about if you've ever taught your sibling something good? Any parent in here who's taught their child how to be kind to someone else, or how to pray, or how to say subhanAllah, or how to do good actions. Just someone who teaches good is somebody who the angels make dua for. And not just the angels, actually. This hadith also says, even the one in the sea. There's another one that talks about the one who's uh, a student of knowledge. But the fact that you do good, you make dinner for your family, and you teach them the etiquette of saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim before you eat, the dua of eating before you eat, cleaning up that it's part of the sunnah to be clean. These are good actions. And the angels make dua for you when you teach others that. And not only that, when they do it because you taught them, who gets the reward? Yes, the person teaching. The person teaching gets that reward. It goes back to them whenever they do it. When you eat suhoor, there's a hadith that you eat suhoor and the angels make dua for you. This is also, I believe, in Imam Ahmed, Muslim Imam Ahmed, that the angels make dua for the one who makes suhoor, even if it's just a sip of water. SubhanAllah. How merciful is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And yeah, everyone is like, I really never wake up. <laughs> All y'all <laughs> who never wake up for Zahu. <laughs> the angels are making dua for you. I'm just kidding. That's all they are. But inshallah, they will make more dua when you wake up for Zahu. If we say salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Uthman radiallahu anhu asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the angels that are part of our lives. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught him that there is an angel waiting at your lips that when you send salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that that angel goes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and mentions your name to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And not just that, that you get the salam that you make. When you say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, or peace be upon him, or sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or any form of salawat, you are raised 10 ranks in paradise, you are forgiven for 10 sins, you get 10 rewards, and what the angels send that salam to you. You can never lose with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you visit someone who is sick, the angels, if you go in the afternoon, 70,000 angels pray for your forgiveness until the morning. If you go in the morning, 70,000 angels pray for you until the afternoon. And of course, of course, this includes someone you visit in the hospital, but what about when your own child is sick and you're like, please don't let anyone else in my family get sick and please let them get better soon. Visit them. Make the intention that when you're caring for them, you're also visiting them. When you visit a family member, when you are taking care of a sick person, tell other, if you are sick, tell your family to come visit me in my room, come. But also wear a mask so y'all don't get sick too. But the angels make dua for you. Seven, not just one, not 70,000. SubhanAllah, there are too many opportunities for the angels to make dua for us. And one thing that I shared in the talk yesterday, I know some of you are here and I'm sorry that you're hearing this information again, but I just want to make sure that we leave knowing 
that it's about the action and the intention, not about our emotional state. This is something I remember hearing a lot from unnamed places um, that Ramadan, if we're not weeping, then how really successful were we in Ramadan? That if we're not crying in the last 10 nights, then how do we know Allah has forgiven us? Have you heard messages like that before? There was a sister when I made Hajj, my mom and I, alhamdulillah, when we made Hajj, there was a woman sitting across from us in the tent. And she was so talkative, very, very like talkative and just wanted to get to know everyone. Very, very sweet. And then we went to Arafah. And the next day, when we were all back in the same tent, she was very quiet. She just kept looking down, staring at one spot. And I went to her and I was like, are you, are you okay? And she responded by saying, I didn't cry a single time in Arafah. Not a single tear in Arafah. And I don't know if my hajj is accepted. And I just want to walk you back to the day before in Arafat. The message is the day before on the microphone in the tent where everybody was making dua. Because they were trying to do these group like, in, in reminders throughout the day. And one after another, one person after another said that if you are not crying today, if you don't weep today, then how can you expect that your hajj will be accepted? If you're not crying now, your heart is as hard as a rock. And hellfire is fueled by the rocks. When you hear messages like this and you don't immediately weep out of awe to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it can impact your psyche. Because this isn't one or two random people. We've probably all heard messages like this and have very likely many of us, if not all of us, many of us, have decided whether or not we were successful in Ramadan based on how many times we've cried out of love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our salah. And the reality is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never requires crying as a form of showing that we worship him and that we obey him. It's sweet when it happens. It's a gift to feel it sometimes. But the fact that you still worship and you don't feel it is a testament to the strength of your faith. You're not worshiping a feeling. You're not chasing a feeling. You're worshiping the one who created your feelings. Okay, you're worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created you and all of your feelings. I don't want that to be misunderstood. But the point is that when you worship him, this is what he asks. How do we become those whom he loves? By doing the obligation. And then after the obligation, the extra. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us, when Allah loves you, when Allah loves someone, he tells Angel Jibreel alayhi salam that he loves this person. And then Angel Jibreel alayhi salam tells the inhabitants of the heavens that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves this person. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fills the people's hearts with love for him or her on earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the one who acts for his sake. And of course, the intention. And of course, when we feel the emotion, alhamdulillah. But the fact that you still keep going is a sign of his love for you. There were three companions who committed uh, a major mistake that they didn't go with the Prophet ﷺ on, uh, on w when, when they had to go for jihad. And the way that the Qur'an describes their state in Surah At-Tawbah, وَضَاقَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَرْضِ That like the earth just became so constricted, the vastness of the earth, and they felt like they had nowhere to go. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ثُمَّ تَابَ عَلَيْهِمْ لِيَتُوبُوا he turned to them, he turned to them so that they would turn to him. He turned to them so that they would turn to him. Anytime in your heart, if you've had a moment where you have wanted to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's Allah inviting you back to him. If you think you want to go pray, it's an invitation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you think you want to repent, you're sorry for what you've done, it's an invitation from him. And if you haven't felt that, but you felt bad about not feeling that, that's an invitation too. And if you're none of those things, let's just make dua, may Allah put it on all of our hearts. The fact that you care at all, the fact that you feel guilty, that guilt, that only comes from loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fact that you're worried that you feel apathetic, like I feel apathetic, should I be worried about that? That in and of itself is a sign of Allah's love for you.
And when you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you believe in him, this is the world that we, we actively worship him in. But in the moment of death, in this moment of, that moment of meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the culmination of how the angels interact with us in all of our lives. That in that moment, subhanAllah, my mom, she told me a story of her friend whose little sister had cancer and they knew that her time was finishing and her parents were in the hospital room. And she said that she, her, the girl, she, the little girl, she said, who are those beautiful people who just came into my room? And the parents couldn't see anybody. And they were like, who? Who, who do you see? And she said, they're carrying the most beautiful white dress. And then she passed away. We don't know what people are seeing in the moment that they're passing. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ استقاموا. Those who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they are firm on that. تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ That the angels descend upon them. أَلَّا تَخَافُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا Don't be sad. Don't be afraid. And don't be sad. وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ الَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تُعَدُونَ And glad tidings for what you are promised. نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاءُكُمْ We are your allies. We are your protectors. We are your guardians. This moment where you think you might be so alone and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises you that he's created beings of light to give you the glad tidings as you as you go into the, to the next phase, as you go into the akhirah, to forever, as you go into forever. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he asked some of the companions, what do you think this verse means? إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ استقاموا. What is ثُمَّ استقاموا? And the companion said, those who don't commit sin. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, no, you've given it a meaning it doesn't have. It means those who believe in Allah. You believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, the scholars of tafsir, when talking about the verse that you come on the day of judgment, it's not, none of these things are beneficial except for the one that comes with this qalbin salim. It's often translated as a pure heart. So then you think, okay, a pure heart is someone who doesn't commit sin. But the scholars clarify this doesn't mean sin because we're all going to commit sin. But do you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and have certainty on that belief and have certainty in the hereafter? And if sometimes you have doubt in that, if sometimes you're laying in bed and you're like, is this for real? Is there really a hereafter? Is this really the truth? And then you have to talk through it and you're like, oh yeah, for sure. Oh no, it is. When you go through that conversation, remember that the companions in Sahih Muslim came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and told him, sometimes we have these thoughts, we can't even say them out loud. The Prophet ﷺ was like, you, you, do, you really have thoughts like that? And the companions were like, yes. And the Prophet ﷺ said, that's al-iman. That is clear faith. The fact that sometimes you have these thoughts that you're not even sure you're allowed to have. And you're worried about it, that is a sign of true faith. And of course, if you have questions, if you have doubts, ask about them. Ask about those specific, specific things. And then after clarifying that, go back to the fact. That even Ibrahim alayhi salam asked Allah, a prophet of Allah who was thrown into a fire that was made cool, who saw miracle after miracle after miracle, said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Arini kayfa tuhil mawta. Show me how you raise the dead. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala res- responded with, Qala awalam tu'min. Don't you believe? And of course Allah knows that Khalil Allah believes. And he said, Bala walakin li yatuma inna qalbi. So that my heart feels this certainty and peace. This, 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 this affirmation, if that is a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then what about all of us? To be the person who believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala their whole life and who sometimes struggles and who sometimes doubts, but then goes back to this belief, this is the one insha'Allah. This is the one insha'Allah who the angels will give the glad tidings. And to end, there is this narration of Sa'id ibn Jubair, radiallahu anhu that he mentions in the tafsir of an ayah that talks about the people in paradise being with those that they love. And he talks about a man who comes and in paradise he looks around and he asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where is, where is, where is my dad? Where is, where is my spouse? 
Where, where's my grandpa? Where, where's my son? He doesn't see his loved ones there in Jannah. And then it is said to this person, you, you, you did the action. You worked. You worked to get here. You did the work. They, 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 didn't even, they believed, but they didn't do that work. And this man, he responds by saying, I worked for me, but I also worked for them. I worked for me, but I also worked for them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want this person to be sad in Jannah. And so he calls that those people be entered into the level of paradise that this person is in just so that they're not sad in paradise. One of the ways in which our dua can be accepted is when we make dua for someone else. When we make dua for someone else. There's a sister here who told me that one time all Ramadan she didn't feel anything. She didn't feel a single thing all Ramadan. And one day while she was praying, she just started making dua for the person next to her because she had just talked to the person next to her who would look really down. And that person said, I haven't felt anything this Ramadan. She was like, me too. And in sajda, she made dua for her to feel something this Ramadan, just to feel something in Ramadan. And in that salah, this start, sister for the first time started breaking down, started weeping, started crying. When you make dua for someone behind their back without their knowledge, an angel says, Ameen, and for you, including when you make dua for your loved ones including when you beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide your loved ones, including when you pray for your children and every single person whom you wish to see in the highest paradise, while we pray for ourselves to be there first and foremost, we also pray for the people that we love. And inshallah, ya Rabbi, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that today we will be counted as those, not just for us, not just for us, but for every single person that we love as well. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashidu wa ilaha ila an, nasdaqifirika wa nitu huwalaik. Thank you so much. I know it's extremely late on a Sunday night. Thank you so much all for staying this late. May Allah bless you and answer every single one of your du'a this Ramadan with even more than you can ask for. Ameen.